And now we're going to go to Mr. Doug Miller for a tour of his shack. Uh, Doug, you can go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Hey, this is no frilly software, no fancy graphics. Uh, W4DML, Doug Miller. I don't want the dollar sign says, well, I put too much money into ham radio. Wait, I got started in ham radio. This, well, what happened there? Here we go. Anyway, I got started in ham radio. This guy was my mentor, W4BV, in my hometown of Fayetteville. He started with the spark gap generators in the Navy. You can see this QSL card is 1934. I took my novice test on his uh, uh, breakfast uh, dining room table, and uh, uh, he would give me parts for Christmas. And that's where I got my interest in building things and working on electronics through, through him. What I lost his, his uh, QSL card, so I went on eBay and found this one. While I was there, I saw this W1AW, and it's a 1939. It happened to be signed by Hal Bupp. I like old vintage stuff and ham radio, and this was the, the first official operator for W1AW, and he built, he and another guy built all the equipment there. This is my first key. I still have it. It's a J37. And that and the J38 were pretty common. Uh, here's a picture of the, my first transmitter. I don't have it anymore. I had three crystals for 40 meters, and it was CW only. And for your novice license, you couldn't have a VFO. And that was this was either a kit or a uh, pre-assembled, pretty simple transmitter. This is my first receiver. I donated mine oh, a couple of years ago to a B-17 that's being restored, but this is a BC-348. A lot of these got out in the ham radio side. Uh, this particular one was on the LST that came to Nashville, and uh, several of us went down and operated uh, portable from their station. But uh, anyway, this one thing was in B-24s, B-17s, and it was the liaison radio, and I'm not – Sure, what else it was in, but uh, anyway, my first receiver. This is the antenna, one of the antennas that I have. I, I live in a HOA. Uh, the regulations are kind of funny. Uh, it says something about now has changed for something about receiving, transmitting antennas, but I didn't want to push my luck. So I came up with this telescopic mast and I, uh, to mount up on my uh, screen in porch and I've got a membrane roof. And for that reason, I welded up some 20 pound barbell weights and made a, like a lunar landing uh, pad for this thing. And uh, the drive motor that raises and lowers it is in the uh, inverted garbage can I used. Uh, this hex beam is 20 through six meters. This is a two meter Yagi. And this is my air TV antenna. And by the way, this, this two meter Yagi is that's right at the frequency of air TV. This antenna will pick up air TV. So I thought my backup plan, if anybody ever said anything to me, uh, I said, that's my TV antennas. But uh, I used to have a lot of these cryptomera trees here and you couldn't see it, but uh, I've quit worrying about lowering it. You can't see it from the front of the house. This is my uh, 7540 dipole I made out of copper clad steel and PVC spacers and PVC pipe with ferrites in it. And I use a, uh, I like the LMR flex coax because it'll move. It's low loss, but it'll move with the, when the wind's pulling the trees back and forth and uh, uh, gives you some room to expand there. All my antennas come into these coax switches, uh, one for the dipole, one for the hex beam. I have uh, four positions of the ground on this. One goes to my, I've got another, uh, another, a, uh, bench and ham shack in another room. And so I can switch that and I switch another position of the, the my Collins radios with the, where I can switch to either one of the antennas. And then this other one is for radios above, uh, which is a, a, a little flex and a KX3 and position four here goes to my K3 station. This is the control box I built for the raising and lowering the uh, mast for the antenna, a backup power supply. Uh, this is a Collins station. Uh, this is a Collins S1 line, Collins S3 line. Uh, these are 30L1 uh, amplifiers. Military uh, owned a lot of these. They are, puts out about 500 watts, uses uh, four 811 tubes. 
my 32 S1 transmitter is down right now, and I'm trying to get motivated to, to repair it. I can't seem to do it, but I'm working on it. And while I've got this picture, this is my microphone for my K3 station. It's an Electro Voice shotgun mic. This one I found at Hamfest. It didn't work. So I put a cartridge in the base with the original ones. It was terrible. It sounded like you were talking down a pipe because you were. So then I machined this tip and put a uh, Howl cartridge on it. So And that goes into a little plastic project box with a push-to-talk button with a jack on the side where I've got my push-to-talk, uh, I mean my uh, foot switch also. So I operated either way. This is uh, you an know, overall view of the other part of the shack. I like uh, to collect old tubes, uh, mainly transmitting tubes and uh, uh, power supply rectifier tubes. Although this CRT came out of a Heathkit uh, station monitor that I rebuilt. 3-500s are like in the, uh, the Heathkit amps I have. And this is a 6146, it was in the, uh, the uh, 32S1 transmitter and uh, S3s. Collins and the 811s was in the amp, so pretty pretty common tubes. This is my uh, Drake TR7. This is a, a solid state. Uh, uh, one of the last uh, end of their reign was solid state TR7. They had uh, all solid state. Uh, this is a transceiver. This is a tuner, power supply, uh, SWR watt meter speaker. I use a Sure Triple Four. Uh, works well with this this uh, this radio. Uh, I've got a this is a Brown Brothers straight key that's hooked to it. This is a Begali key. I'll show you a picture of that lately later. I'm not much of a CW operator, but I, I like the mechanical side of it. Little Oak Hills Research QRP receiver I use on QRP. This is a kit. They're great little uh, little uh, watt meters. Oh, I found my old novice license here. And uh, oh, this is me out with Ed and Scott and Tim. I was working Mike in the Calgary club station in Canada. And he know I worked him a lot. And he's used to me being in Tennessee. And he, I told him we were there pheasant hunting. He said, you know, I worked somebody there last year. It was pheasant hunting. It was Tim Kreth. So anyway, that was kind of kind of fun trip. This is the uh, my Ellicraft K3 station. This was... When I, I got this, I was interested in it because you, you could have the alter, uh, alternative of assembling these, screwing them together, plugging them together. And I was used to building radios in my past. So I did that. That's the transceiver, the pan adapter, the, trans, uh, the amplifier, the antenna tuner, my KX3, antenna rotator. And this is a PAL star inline uh, uh, dual double cross needle uh, watt meter and SWR meter. I like these meters. You see a lot of information at one time. You can see reflected power, I mean, reflected power and forward power. And if you just have one, you see, and oh, I got great forward power, but if you flip the reflected, your reflected power may be as, as bad as the, uh, uh, as much as the forward power. So it, it's a lot of information and uh, you get in one view. I, I use uh, HRD, QRZ, uh, let's see. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot my, my uh, UHF, VHF radios are here. This is the little Flex, 10, Flex 1500 QRP uh, digital radio I bought from uh, Cliff Batson, and it's a fun little radio. Enjoy operating it. This is the County Go uh, kit that I'm responsible for maintaining and checking out every week and whatever, and, and ready to take it if there's needed an emergency. Just upgraded it to the new latest edition of Vara software last weekend. And uh, it's really neat, this, this little DRA50 uh, uh, digital interface by Masters Communications. I think Hilton's the guru and expert on those. But between the two, this thing is just super fast now compared to my old uh, uh, WinLink uh, and uh, the, uh, the digital interface I used to use. And I've got it just on a, a Comet uh, 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 440 uh, two meter uh, antenna mag mount works works fine for me where I am, and uh, this is a West Mountain audio system two speakers hooked to the K3. I, I like the audio from that. This is my other other station, and this is all tube and more vintage. This is a early 50s 
Johnson Viking Ranger. This is, I use this for AM, it's no sideband. I did a lot of modifications on this thing, added push to talk. This is a 1940s vintage Hammerlin HQ 129X. And they, they it's, you know, it puts out about 30 watts. So I cut, it's not, not really, I guess, QRP, but on AM, that's QRP. This is the uh, 1970s vintage uh, SB 102 Heathkit station. Uh, and I've got the uh, SB221 amplifier. I rebuilt this thing and replaced the diode boards and capacitors and made the soft start for it and whatever. The power supply and the speaker, the station monitor was a mess. That's replaced the CRT, had to rewire that thing. And uh, anyway, it's a, it's a great, great radio. It was their last uh, all tube, that SB line that they made. This is an Argon. Japanese microphone, looks like a harmonica player's microphone and it uh, works works well with a Heath kit. And I have another SB221 that I rebuilt and I use it with the uh, Drake TR4CWRIT station. It's the uh, MN2000 antenna tuner, the, this speaker and power supply for the TR4. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a 300 watt tuner. And the reason this, they came out with this because if you ran barefoot uh, with the TR4 CW, this thing was pushing close to 200 watts out. And so that was the, the pair to that. And if you added their L4 amplifier, you moved up to the MN2000. This is an R4B uh, Drake receiver. Uh, a lot of people say it's the best sounding receiver they ever made. This speaker for it, another Daiwa split needle SWR power meter. I bring my two antennas from that other switch I showed you previously. The two coaxes come in under this work table and I can select the, between the dipole and the hex beam. And then up here, I, I have the five different workstations on here that I select from this coax switch. This is another uh, AM, uh, my other AM station. This is a, only a 20 watt uh, LISCO. This thing, I did a lot of major work on it, added a push to talk relay. And so it would mute the, this R390 receiver and also switch the dial key relay, which what we used to use for uh, switching the, between the transmitter and receiver, you wouldn't need it done internally. And if it did do all that, uh, then people used to operate this way. You'd have to turn the transmitter to transmit, the receiver to receive, and then switch back when you got ready to listen. And it, you know, it would wear you out. I have my old, well, my old CW uh, key hooked up to this uh, transmitter. Uh, this, uh, this is a, a duplexer for a, a, a repeater, another duplexer. I pick those things up at half pass when I see them and I've uh, got a setup where I can set the frequencies on them for whatever it need to be. It's another R390. These were designed by Collins and came in right after World War II. Really great receivers. They are, uh, uh, this, these are, this was made by Stuart Warner. This was uh, Electronics Acceptance Corporation. There, so there were several companies that were contracted to make these, but I think uh, Collins still did the QC on these things. This is my kind of messy looking bench here, but uh, I, I like vintage test equipment. This is the uh, Collins transmitter I'm trying to get motivated to fix. Uh, this is a Motorola uh, uh, communication system analyzer. This thing was multi expensive when it was new. I got this one, it was old and it still wasn't cheap. But anyway, got this because it had a spectrum analyzer tracking generator in it. And what was uh, for building, I like tuned circuits, I like building filters, and you know, you can set adjust the duplexers to the right frequencies with these things, and it's a, it's a great tool. Uh, this is a, an older HP signal generator. This thing cost thousands of dollars new. And now they're, you know, they're, they're lost. They're not as nearly as valuable. This was an old signal generator that was used at the time of the R390s for uh, aligning those uh, receivers. But it's, it's tube, works great. These are uh, high impedance uh uh, voltmeters, which you use for alignment of radios, uh, you want high impedance, and no, doesn't interfere with the circuits when you insert them. I've got a 2KW fan cooled uh, uh, dummy load to work on stuff, and these are 
signal tracer or oh, another signal generator. Uh, Variax are important for working out stuff. This one, right, I've got a couple right here. This one goes to, uh, I've got an amp meter and a watt meter hooked to it. And when you're bringing stuff up, when you're bringing the voltage up, you got to watch the amperage and make sure there's not a short and you shut it off before you uh, make smoke. The newer instruments I've got, uh, uh, I bought was this uh, uh, spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator in it. And it sort of takes the place of this. The other, the Motorola, it it's really works well and uh, works now. This is a function generator, a siglent, and this is the oscilloscope uh, siglent that I have. So that's, and, and I've got a lot of, you know, uh, component uh, uh, generation tools, FM signal generator, and especially type meters that I use. Or all this, uh, the VNA, I've got a VNA and Anyway, VNA is a, a really neat vector network analyzer. Uh, this is my my uh, dipole I'm analyzing, and this look this gives you a lot of information. You want the return loss to be high uh, high dBs uh, means minimal loss. You can see up here my antenna is resonant at 3.840 megahertz and SWRS 104. This information over here. Well, back here, over here uh, pertains to this marker that you see the data, but you want your uh, phase angle is zero and SWR is right at one and then 50 here on your impedance line. And so it tells you all that sort of thing. But today you can buy for 50 bucks or the bigger one for a hundred bucks, this little nano VNA that will give you just about all the same information this thing also has a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, shoot, I can't even think the right word, the, uh, uh, for checking coax and locating uh, time domain re reflectometer. It has that function in it, so you can analyze coax, see if you've got a short or whatever, and it'll tell you how many feet. It's also got a, a, a spectrum analyzer and a tracking generator, so I can build in filters. You can do the same thing. So it's amazing what's available now for the money. This is just some of the IQ, tube testers, uh, spare ham tubes and tube caddies, 40s receiver, other vintage test equipment, power supplies, uh, 1940s Hamlin are restored, uh, 51 national receiver. P parts, I keep big parts in Tupperware containers and, you know, like transformers and whatever. And uh, the, then I pull all these drawers out to show you from most of this is a higher voltage capacitors because I did a lot of restoring of AM broadcast and FM broadcast receivers, tube types, and they all have higher voltage components. But anyway, I keep capacitors, resistors, and hardware connectors and whatever, and fuses and light bulbs and whatever. It's aggravating to pick me working on something that not have the parts. This is a, an LC tuner I built from scratch. Uh, has a switch on it where you can switch from the, goes to the inductor, the capacitor, or the capacitor, the inductor. This is a T tuner that I built, and this thing will tune anything. Uh, and uh, this uh, harmonic distortion analyzer and an audio signal generator. This thing you can, uh, is a heat kit. You can measure the distortion in an audio system. A little AM uh, one tube transmitter I built once upon a time and a capacitor meter. And put... This is my go kit that I took to, uh, I got a license for a VP5 uh, Turks and Caicos station. Went down there when my son got married and I so I took my go kit here. And in that you know, I've got the 706, which does, you know, UHF, VHF, it does HF, antenna tuner. I had an AC power supply and I, it was in a different case, but. This is my antenna. antenna. It's a homemade link dipole. I carry a couple hundred feet of parachute cord to string it up. I wait to throw it up in the trees. I use uh, power poles for the links. This thing does uh, 80, 40, 20, and 17. I could add other bands, but those are the ones I enjoy. Then the digital interface. Some of the other things I've enjoy building our filters. These are made bandpass filters here. So if you're working 20 meters and 40 meters and you're close by, this will minimize the, it only allows a certain range of uh, frequencies to pass, minimizes your interference with other folks. 
this was a broadcast station high pass had trouble WSM coming in some locations. And this is a smaller version that uh, knocks out WSM as well in the little bit X radios that some of us built RF samplers. You can't, you know, put a strong RF signal into a oscilloscope or whatever. So I built a couple of those and have a factory one too. This one was a Bob Heil design. It used a capacitor to kind of couple the RF. I don't like that. It's potential failure, major problems. This one uses an inductive coupling. Inrush uh, uh, reducer. I, this, I built this because the old uh, the old radios for rocker switches, you can't find those there, as they say, unobtainium. them. And when you operate them a lot, you know, you, you've got an arc going through the contacts can eventually burn them up. So well, I use this to, uh, to I keep the, the, the equipment turned on, but I, and, and the rocker switch on the panel, but I use this switch right here to turn it on. It's fused. What it is is a, is it's got a, a resistor and a relay uh, it starts through a resistor and it reduces the voltage and current in the inrush, and then the t relay times out and goes across the line to full power. But anyway, one that you, yeah, I think MFJ Bills uh, offers one of those too, so you can buy them commercially. This is one of my favorite meters uh, just for, for making uh, tuned circuits. Uh, Dave Matthews and I both tried out a bunch of them and compared them one time, and this little peak, uh, I think soda beams sells these, you know, you need to be able to measure uh, inductance and the uh, and uh, capacitance in the 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 picofarad and uh, micro range. And uh, with this this you can do it when you're trying to wind the toroids or check the capacitance of capacitors in a filter. I, the other thing, I, I, the hex beam, I I got really interested in my, when I got one. I wanted to build a portable hex beam, so I started. I built them, and this is the latest hub that I built for those. And uh, I worked with Bob Petrie as, as I think is selling some of these at TN07, but it was a just a uh, machine those. And uh, the, here is a photo. We I forgot we were out near the library or somewhere one day, and this I had this I have the portable hex beam fits in a cloth bag, it does 20 and 17 meters. I think I'm running the KX3. This is my mobile antenna. Not really. This is a was the uh, uh, Bob wanted to uh, come up with a X beam, and simpler the hex beam. So I worked on the making a hub and determined the right wire lengths for this. So this is a twenty meter uh, uh, X beam, and it worked, it's a you know it's a directional antenna. It work, works pretty well. But the cool thing about this is Bob here gave this uh, one of these to these three sisters here. And they did uh, uh, a de-expedition down at the uh, Dry Tortugas, which you have to get special permission to go to. And I met these young ladies several years ago at uh, Dayton. And uh, it's these, the three of the colorful dresses are the sisters. And this is their friend here. But anyway, this uh, Grace here had uh, uh, a hat on, I mean, Faith, but I saw her and she was 10 years old and she said, and I said, I'm an extra. And I looked at that and I said, extra class. She said, yes, all these girls have their extra class license. And I think they did it all at 10. So between there, those, these girls and our Pearson brothers, maybe there's a future for, for ham radio. This is her dad. He's a cinematographer and very supportive of their, their ham operations. This is all oh, other thing I, I like to make. I want to come up with a simple transmitter. So this is a uh, uh, one transistor, nine volt battery, uh, uh, used to color crystal out of a TV. A friend of mine that repaired TVs would give me a bunch of these. So that's in the 40 meter band. So that's the whole radio. And this one is the antenna and ground. And I, I wanted to build a simple receiver, but I never was able to. So I, I got, I want a, let's see if I can get this to focus. Yeah, at the giveaway at uh, WCARES meeting, I've got this tuna can receiver. So anyway, that between this and that, it's a, a, a complete little station. Some of the keys I've got, you know, several of us have got these Navy flame proof keys, but the interesting thing I've uh, found is it was apparently copied from the German Luftwaffe. 
I didn't realize that until I f- f- did a little research. This is the Brown Brothers Great Key. This is the uh, uh, Begali Italian made, just beautifully well made, heavy uh, uh, panel. Man, it, it is a work of art. This is a Vibraflex key from the 20s that uh, Dave Matthews gave to me. Had to do a little repair on it to get it working, but it, it it's a it's a fine art being able to use one of these things. It uh, has a spring. The dies you just do like normal key, but the dits uh, when you push this push the dit key, this this shaft moves over away from this dampener counterweight, and this spring right here just bounces back and forth, controlling the dots. And to change the frequent uh, how frequently you send out dots you slide this counterweight back and forth. But anyway, it's quite an art to learn how to master that. This is not ham, but it's a telegraph key, telegrapher's key with a sounder. And uh, uh, it goes over to, this is one of the, the first uh, repeater. This uh, it go, it goes to this, the key actuates this, uh, these electromagnetics to close the contact. And then this line here, I've got it hooked to a light bulb, but in a, Real system, it would go out to another repeater down the road and then to another. Uh, it would be impossible to send a signal in a wire across the country at uh, the low voltage from batteries. So that's the way they got around being able to send uh, telegraph at long distances. Part of my, my childhood, I tore up a lot of Victrolas. Uh, crank, and so our, as pennants, I restored, have restored several and enjoyed like mechanical stuff. And then I've, I've rebuilt a lot of... Uh, of old radios, the oldest one I re- rebuilt was this uh, Majestic 1930s. It was quite a uh, lot of work. This was my dad's old AM radio. And that's what got me started into repairing the things. My mother asked me if I could get it running. And I, it's called an All-American 5. And I, as a kid, I, uh, it was in this plywood box. I think it, it got it fallen off the table and broken. So my dad made the box that goes in it. Well, this thing... The All American Five has no transformer. And I'll tell you this, so in case you ever run across a radio with no transformer, well, this thing used to shock me, and I I didn't know why it shocked me, but as when I restored it, I figured that out. It has no transformer, so depending how you plug it in, uh, the chassis has got 120 volts on it, <laughs> and, and if uh, if and the other way, if you plug it in differently. Uh, it may not have 120, but when you turn the power on, it has 120. So I put a polarized plug on it. So it always is only hot when you turn it on and put a note on the back, that, you know, this warning of that danger. But if you ever run across these things, you got to be careful with them. That's uh, more the old phone radios, Philco's, like Philco's. Part of my tube collection, well, tube collection. This is a, a rectifier tube out of a 50,000 watt broadcast station that had six of these plus a seventh standby. They could switch in if one of them burn out. So I made this support for it to, to wouldn't tip over. And then while I was doing, it, I said, you know, I've got an acorn tube. I'll make the little baby tube to match it. These are my spark generators or better known as Tesla coils, which was Tesla's first, uh, I guess why he got the patent for the, uh, uh, the radio is because it has capacitors and an inductor and is a tuned circuit. Uh, difference from this, you had a key to this, take off this donut and put a wire out for an antenna and you got a spark generator. This is kind of what it looks like, but don't do this in your garage. This will take out your garage door opener receiver. Don't ask me how I know that. Uh, Ed said something about showing my shop, but I didn't know which one, but I, I do have a machine shop that, I, like I said, build the antenna parts or whatever I need to. And I, I like old machinery to restore it. So one of my old drill presses, all metal. This is my uh, Bridgeport milling machine. I rebuilt this thing too, which is more another hobby is rebuilding old mechanical things. This is how I turn the hole, bore the holes with this rotary table, bore the holes for the, the hex beam. You rotate it at regular intervals to, to drill the holes. This is a, a 3000 plus pound lathe. Oh, and another electrical thing, I enjoy that. All this is three-phase, but I make my own three-phase, use this motor, 15 horsepower. It's got a rotary phase generator. You start this thing with capacitors, and once it's running, it works like an alternator. So you you tap off the three leads, it generates three-phase power to run everything. And I love ham fists. 
And this was at Dayton. These guys claim to be from Texas. They do look like Jeff Standifer, but I'm not so sure that they're really from this planet. They were, they were riding around in this earth rover with all these antennas, but uh, have this or, and this is my favorite Matthews. You remember the show, my favorite Mar uh, Martian? Well, this is my favorite Matthews. Here we just talk one another into buying some nice signaling equipment. Uh, there's my wife hanging out with a ham. This Lolita. I'm not jealous. <laughs> I'm not jealous. It's a fellow ham. So, but you ever wonder about the name ham? Where did that come from? And why was the first primate sent into space? His name was Ham. You know, is that insinuating something to do with monkeys and ham and whatever? I don't know. But I looked it up. And it said ham is a uh, where it came from was supposedly maybe an urban legend. The Harvard Radio Club was operated by Hyman, Almy, well, and Murray, so that was too much, so they shortened it to ham. So supposedly that's where we got our name, and that's all, folks. The end. <laughs>